as you might know, or maybe you don't know, shouldn't assume you care that much about my life, but maybe you're aware that I've been having a foot problem for the past three months. Since February 18th, to be precise, I've been having this issue where it's like the skin on the bottom of my foot is so sensitive to contact with anything that I haven't really been able to stand with bare feet or even in shoes very easily, walk around, really do anything, uh, anything that I would have normally done if I could put my foot on the floor. So as you might imagine, my apartment is a disaster. I haven't really been comfortable vacuuming, washing the floor. Oh, you just, you don't want to go into my kitchen. It's, it's pretty brutal right now. That's not what I wanted to talk about. I, I feel like I'm in a place where I'd like to share a few things about what I've been going through in the last three months of having a little bit of a limitation. I'm in a place now where I can walk if I have thick enough shoes on. And that reminds me of really the key message that I want to share today. Just the idea of having thick soled shoes on, it brings up the, the idea that minimalist shoes are the best and going barefoot is the best. And that is certainly not the case for me right now. And there is just so much dogma, so much you should do this, you shouldn't do that. This is the best thing you should do for your body to feel good and be healthy. And this is the worst thing you should do. You should eat Brussels sprouts because they are so nutritious and blah, blah, blah. There's just so much bullshit. And I've been learning just how much I have believed about what is best for me and my body and my health has been untrue. And I want to unpack some of that. And I want to share how my foot pain has revealed a lot of that to me. The first thing I want to say is that I don't want your pity. And for anyone who's in pain right now in a way that is severely limiting their way of life, I don't think pity is what we need. And I struggled to get that sentence out in a way that didn't sound mean or not nice. Pity is not what we need. I know you mean well, but I personally feel disempowered when people ask about my foot with this sympathetic tone of voice and these puppy dog eyes, like, oh, how was your foot today? And I know they mean well, but it just pisses me off. <laughs> I just had to get that out. And the reason why it does is because that statement, oh, how is your foot? It's just the tone of voice in which they say it. It's not the words, it's the way people are saying it. It's almost communicating to me that I should feel bad that my foot hurts. And I don't think it's true because what if this foot pain I'm having is actually the best thing that ever happened to me? And I wanna talk about why I think that's the case. And when what you say to me leads me to feel that I should feel badly that my foot hurts, that doesn't help my healing process. I remember when I first had this problem and I'm so grateful because I, I know somebody who was able to guide me that maybe I should go to the hospital because I was, I was definitely in a place where I couldn't even stand up and I was almost going into shock. And actually this happened on the day I was teaching uh, an anatomy in motion introductory workshop. And halfway through the workshop, I was getting this sensation in my body that my system was shutting down because of the pain. And I was like, okay guys, let's take a lunch break. <laughs> and I lied down on the floor, took a few breaths, and realized, wow, this is a real problem. I can't push through this anymore. That day, I was talking with somebody who said, hey, it sounds like there's a real problem here. You should go to the hospital. And let me tell you, 
uh, going through the emergency room is not a place you want to end up. I mean, yay for free healthcare, but wow, when you have a, a structural or biomechanical or any kind of pain related problem, the doctors and especially in the emergency room or yeah, emergency room, it's more like a, a long winding hallway with several waiting rooms, but it's not the place you want to end up and get advice from because literally all they did was take my blood and do some scans and tell me nothing's wrong with you. And yet I can't stand and I almost passed out. But anyway, I have to backtrack. I got a little bit off track there. It was disempowering. Going through the traditional medical system was very disempowering. And so after that experience of being in the emergency room, coming home, the next day, <laughs> stayed there overnight, only to get no answers. So I lied in bed for a while that day. I was so tired because I slept in the hospital overnight. And I came home and I just crashed and I cried for a few hours and, and then talked with one of my mentors. And he started asking me questions. Questions like, okay, tell me what you were doing a few weeks leading up to this problem. What happened the day of? He was probing into my experience of how did things come to be this way? And in a way that wasn't sympathetic. It wasn't a pity party. It wasn't, oh, I'm so sorry that your foot hurts. I hope you feel better. <laughs> it was, let's get to the facts. Let's be objective about this. And I so appreciated it. I found it so liberating and so empowering that I could question my, my, my situation in a detached way from my emotional experience of it so I could see it more clearly. So all that to say is that I've been experimenting with not using the words good and bad, but to think of things in terms of this or that, X or Y or Z or Z, as you say in Canada. And yes, I think it was necessary to have someone feel so sympathetic towards me that he directed me to go to the hospital because what if it was something that was really serious? What if it was a blood vessel that had been restricted and I was in some kind of serious danger? Or what if it was some kind of systemic inflammation that I would have wanted to have my blood work done for. It was definitely useful in that moment to feel a sense of urgency in an emotional way that I needed to go get myself checked out. But then once that was done, it was very important for me to look at my facts. So what I'd like to share a little bit more about today is how my foot situation actually has revealed a lot of what I think are useful and important things about this process and what needs to change and what needs to be looked at in order for this to actually heal. And interestingly, none of it is to do with my foot. Let's unpack that. If I start from the beginning, maybe I should share a little bit about what exactly happened People have been asking, did you have an injury? Like what happened to your foot? I didn't injure it, <laughs> literally. I was standing. I was standing in a craniosacral therapy course, an up ledger course, awesome. And in the course, there's lots of standing around and watching demonstrations of treatments. So I was standing there and I was, <laughs> it's so funny because I can remember feeling this particular moment where I was like, oh, it feels so nice to be standing so evenly on my feet. All these years of having a dedicated movement practice to restoring balance in my body has been paying off. This feels awesome. Um, and then I noticed over the course of day two, I started to get this throbbing, painful sensation in my right medial heel. And I've had that before, but it always went away and I never thought anything of it. But this time it didn't go away. It kept getting worse and worse and worse. And what did I do? I didn't listen. I kept working out. If I'm being honest, there was this voice in my head that was saying, there's no way 
you're stopping. There's no way you're resting. You have to keep doing exercise because what if you stop exercising? Oh my God, if you stop exercising, you are gonna get out of shape. You're probably gonna gain weight. People are gonna look at you and think, oh my God, she's gaining weight. And then what are you gonna do? No one's gonna wanna be your friend. No one's gonna wanna work with you. And it just spiraled from there. So I just kind of ignored the pain and pushed through it until that fateful day on February 18th where I was in the workshop teaching and going into shock. <laughs> So that wasn't useful. And so why did that happen? Why did I, was, why was I just standing there and my foot started hurting? So as I was saying before, I was probing into it with my mentor, Chris. And it, it made me think back to when I was 14 and I first started having pain in my body. The first thing that ever started hurting was my right hip. And it started hurting when I was training for ballet uh, and dance generally at the Banff Center, um, Alberta. Um, and it was an amazing experience, actually. It was amazing and it was awful at the same time. But uh, anyway, that's a long story in itself. But anyway, so I started feeling right hip pain for the first time in that period of my life. Just the amount of work I was doing, just all day dancing, not really resting. And, and it was like this pinchy feeling in my hip and I just iced it. And I remember at the end of that six week program, my parents came to pick me up and I was walking with a bit of a limp and they asked me, hey, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I've never been in better shape in my life. And they're like, well, you're walking kind of weird. And I'm like, oh, it's okay. If I just like use this limp, then I don't feel the pain. That was my solution at the time. Literally, if I walk with a limp, I don't feel my pain and it's okay. So whatever movement pattern <laughs> that led to, I am quite sure this is a part of it. But anyway, so let's fast forward a little bit. I had that pain that I had been ignoring and it just became this low level background thing that I kind of always had, but didn't think anything of. Around that same time, I mean, you can see that mindset already in action there that, oh, I should ignore it, just push through it, resting, I, no way I'm resting. I don't talk about this often or in detail, but around that same time as well, I was dealing with an eating disorder. And part of the eating disorder mentality is using exercise. In my case, uh, I was anorexic. And using exercise as a way of burning extra calories to make up for eating is a thing that I very much subscribed to. So again, there's no way I'm resting because if I rest, I will gain weight. If I gain weight, bad things will happen in my life. No one will love me, et cetera. And I can say that now, but I had no idea this mechanic was in play at the time. So, this had a, probably a bit of an impact on the next bit I wanna get into around this. So as I was seeing some practitioners in the here and now in February, when I was having this problem, one thing that was identified that was not quite right with my body was my right hip. I was seeing my, my friend and colleague and boss, Dr. Brock Easter, who is a fabulous chiropractor who doesn't do chiropractory things really. Um, and he was holding my hip and moving it around and he kind of looks at me and he's like, your hip feels very decompressed. And I was under the impression that my hip was compressed, that I needed to stretch it because it was too tight. And, and apparently that wasn't true. So there was another thing for me that just kind of got shattered was that hip stretching or hip decompression if you have a hip that feels compressed, hey, maybe you should think again about that, Monica. Maybe that's not a good thing for you. So that was a moment where it really lit a light bulb in my brain that I need to compress my hip because there's too much tension. And the theory that we have is that the sensation I'm getting in the bottom of my foot, there's nothing wrong with my foot. 
like nothing hurts in my foot when I touch it. The bones are all in the right spot. There's no swelling, but it's just like this tingly, burny, awful feeling when I stand on it in the skin, not even in the muscles, like in the skin. And so it led me to think that it's likely that there's some kind of nerve sensation component to this, like a hypersensitivity of nerves. And so I got to thinking about, well, what if there's too much tension on those nerves, which come right from the hip, the nerves that go down into the foot, they do start up in the lumbar spine, pass through the hip and go all the way down to the foot. So I was like, oh, well, if this hip is under too much tension, it's too depressed, then I need to compress my hip. And I have never thought about needing to compress my hip before. So, okay, let's learn about that. So there was this hip component. And as soon as I started actually with the intention of compressing my hip with the movement work I was doing, things instantly improved. And when I say instantly improved, I mean like got 10% better. It's still a long way to go. So the next thing that I discovered along the way is I was seeing an osteopath. I was seeing two osteopaths, uh, Andy Poulin and another one named Sarah Powell, both colleagues that I work with at the various clinics that I work at. And both of them found like, ooh, Monica, you're digestive system, your intestine does not feel of good health. So let me talk about what happened after I had an eating disorder. Well, after I had one, does it ever go away? Still dealing with it. And in fact, this is part of the process I'm going through now, but not to jump around too much in the story. After I, and perhaps many folks start to realize that this restrictive cycle of eating isn't really going to work. Like at some point I need to get calories in my body if I want to live. And I, I decided that I did want to live, happy to report. <laughs> and so I overcompensated with the eating. and I went through cycles of binge eating and it was extremely painful on my abdomen, just the amount of food I ate without even realizing it. Cause it's kind of like you get a bit numb while you're doing it and don't realize until you're done that oh, this is uncomfortable. So I started to develop in my early 20s to pain in my lower right quadrant of my abdomen. Hmm. <laughs> and I remember going to the doctor about it because I was having so much pain there. And the doctor says, oh yeah, he pokes and prods. So like, is that painful? Is that painful? I'm like, ow, yeah, when you push there, that hurts. He's like, oh, you're constipated. Take a laxative, you'll be fine. So I did, and I wasn't. It didn't do shit. And obviously, taking a laxative doesn't deal with the psychological reason why I kept putting so much food into my body that it would hurt me and cause me to become bloated and constipated in my right side of my abdomen. So anyway, so back to the future, or the now. <laughs> when I was working with the osteopaths and they were putting around in my guts and <laughs> and manipulating the viscera and saying, it feels like just a clusterfuck in your right side of your abdomen. And that was the first time I actually started to take seriously that the way I was living my life, the way I was putting food in my body, the way I was exercising, everything had gotten me to where I was now. If we think about just that area of my lower right abdomen, things like where your appendix is, if you're a woman, where your ovaries are. That area is also around that lumbosacral plexus where the nerves pass through. And this, there was this moment where in my mind, I was like, oh my God, what if the amount to which my bowel is obstructed there is starting to contribute to compressing the nerves in that area. So not only is there maybe tension through the area because of my hip being decompressed, but there's also some compression in the area because of the amount that my guts have become rigid and not moving and potentially pressing into the nerves. I mean, I don't know that's true, but as a theory, as a hypothesis, I want to explore this and see if this is part of the process because I certainly can't ignore it now. 
And that's kind of the way that these things work is we don't know. We just don't know what the cause is sometimes. And we have to explore hypotheses and treat it like an experiment. What if it is my hip? What if I try compressing it? Does that make things feel better? Yes, okay, let's keep doing that. No, okay, rule that out, move on to the next. And so I realized at this point that the way that my psychology is working, my beliefs about what I should do with my eating and how my body should look and what I can do to manipulate it with food, that all needs to change. And I got to tell you, that was a scary moment. For anyone who has contemplated changing something that makes up their sense of control in their life, tearing that structure down and considering what does my life look like without this control structure, it feels like you're going to die a little bit, or at least your ego is. So I was contemplating, wow, I can't use, first of all, exercise to control my weight anymore because literally I can't stand up. Okay, so that's gone. But now I have to reconsider the way that I've come to be eating. Because I got to say something about this is, I started to realize that binge eating is not a good way to live life as well, nor is starving myself. So I found this weird medium place where I want to say I figured out how to be a functional overeater in a way that didn't make me gain weight. <laughs> and that's not a healthy thing to figure out. But I figured out that if I just eat a lot of vegetables and get a lot of fiber, then it keeps me fuller. And then I don't really feel my hunger as much. But <laughs> I don't function well, or my system doesn't tolerate large amounts of fiber very well. I wish it did, but it doesn't. So for many years, I kind of forced myself to eat a lot more fibrous vegetables, like think Brussels sprouts, broccoli, all those cruciferous things. I actually love those though, that's the thing. Or do I? Did I just train myself to love those? I don't even know anymore. But I'd gotten quite accustomed to eating large quantities of vegetables. And it got to the point where like that was my way of controlling my weight. I can eat a lot of this stuff and get that feeling of that. I guess I got addicted to the feeling of comforting myself with food and numbing myself with food. But that's not working anymore because now the excessive amount of quote unquote healthy food I'm eating, the vegetables, which are healthy, but not if you're eating them with my intention. So that was starting to build up in my insides and causing a lot of that congestion and rigidity and constipation that I was experiencing that was contributing to my viscera feeling awful. So as I contemplated, if I can't use my current eating strategy to control my weight, I'm going to have to figure out what it means to eat normally. I'm gonna to have to start actually getting in touch with my hunger signals. I'm gonna to have to start eating like a normal person, whatever that means. What does that even mean? What a weird question to ask. How do I eat like a normal person? And what if I do it wrong? And what if I, what if I gain weight? It always comes back to that question with me. What if I can't trust myself? What if I can't trust my system to know what's best for me? And then what if in the process of figuring that out, I start to gain weight and <laughs> that spirals into no one loves me and I'm gonna die obviously not true. So in that moment, lying on the table and having my viscera manipulated, all that was running through my head, like, oh my God, I have to change. Oh my God, I have to change. Oh my God, this isn't a foot problem. This is a me problem. This is a life problem.
And I was, I was talking with my mentor again with Chris and he and I kind of were on the same page that, yo, this is not your foot. This is something bigger and it's just showing up in your foot for whatever reason, the symptoms are manifesting in your foot. And yes, there are some mechanical restrictions, mechanical barriers. Like it's amazing how much I learned about how wonky and messed up the biomechanics of my right leg and my pelvis and my spine are. I learned so much and was able to work in a meaningful way on restoring those mechanics. But the real revelation is that this all comes back to that psychology when I was 14 about, I can't stop, I can't stop, I can't change. I have to do this to look a certain way. And that was the intention, that was the thought from which 17 years later, this manifested. And wow, am I grateful that I'm catching it now when I actually have a better chance of changing my life trajectory and not being so crystallized in my ways compared to if, I, if this started to show up when I was 50 or 60. I gotta say, the sooner you can start to work with the pattern that's causing the issue, the easier it is to change it. So things that I started to change is obviously my diet. And there was a lot of dogma I had come to believe that I needed to fight against. For example, I stopped eating so many vegetables and I felt immediately better. I started eating more carbohydrates, more starchy carbohydrates, as opposed to just super fibrous carbohydrates. And I immediately started feeling better. <laughs> and up to that point, I had really believed in the low carb ketogenic diet for whatever reason, just, you know, after having an eating disorder, you kind of jump on every diet bandwagon to try it out. Even intermittent fasting. I didn't fast because I just, I, I don't, I never really liked it. I mean, I, I like eating. I really do. I like eating. I just have this weird, uh, weird habits around it but anyway but I believed that you should be able to go for long periods of time without eating and that eating multiple snacky meals throughout the day isn't healthy I don't know where I picked that up but somewhere along the way I picked that up I started eating more frequent meals and you know what I started feeling better so all these things I believed eat low carb don't eat um don't eat too many meals throughout the day eat less meals more spaced apart eat more vegetables, like all those things, I started to realize these are not good for me right now. Another thing that I started to change, which uh, is a whole other rabbit hole to go down, but I, I had for a long time believed that uh, nose breathing is superior. And I mean, there's a lot of very healthy things about nose breathing, so this is a nuanced statement. But for me, I started to explore mouth breathing as a way of stimulating my diaphragm to move a little bit differently so I could start to pump my abdomen and start to move my guts a lot. So on a whim, I tried mouth breathing because I was so of the belief that only nose breathing is the way. And lo and behold, as soon as I took a breath through my mouth, I started to feel my diaphragm moving in a greater excursion, compressing more of my abdominal contents, expanding my rib cage more. And even when I was doing movements, exploring the biomechanics of my leg and my spine and my pelvis, as I would do them and I would breathe through my mouth, it changed the way the movements felt and put me into better biomechanical positions. I was like, what? So you're telling me that mouth breathing is actually part of this for me as well. And I'm still exploring this. So I've never had trouble. Like it's a thing right now and it's a good thing right now. 
that people are becoming more aware of the negative impacts of nose breathing. So I went through that phase too. I'm like, oh, nose breathing is the best. Let's tape our mouths. So I tried taping my mouth at night and I found it very comforting. <laughs> Some people, it gives them a tremendous amount of anxiety, not being able to breathe through their mouth. For me, I was like, oh, this is nice. I like it. So I never really had trouble not being able to breathe through my nose. So for me, it was, it was very weird embracing mouth breathing in a way that actually felt like it was genuinely useful for me. So I've been bumping into things along the way of this journey that what I thought was good is actually not. And what I initially thought was the worst thing to ever happen to me turned out to be probably the biggest blessing of my life right now. It's given me clarity on the way I was living was too aggressive, too focused on the outer, too focused on trying to prove that I was worthy through my body. Like I had this weird thought one day. I hadn't told my parents that I was having this foot problem because you know, you don't want to worry your parents unnecessarily. Like I can't walk mom and dad. I don't, like, I don't want their pity, but we were planning to get together and I was dreading it because I was like, I don't want to see them. I don't want them to see me not being able to walk. And not just because I didn't want their pity, but because so much of our relationship is usually around going out for walks, doing something active together. I was raised by them to be a very active, movement loving person that was self-sufficient. And then here I am and all I can do is sit down and this thought went through my head of what value am I to my parents if I can't walk because we can't do things together and we're just going to have to sit and talk. My parents are going to be bored with me and resent me. And I was like, oh, wow, isn't that interesting that I'm thinking this right now? So this whole experience brought that up to the surface for me, like, wow, I get a lot of sense of who I am through my body, how it looks, what it can do, what it is for other people. And so I started to shift from that realization that I don't give my body nourishing inputs ever. It's all about output. It's all about proving and doing and forcing and how I look externally to others. So what would it look like to actually nourish my body with movement as input, not output, with food, not as a input that comforts me and is to manipulate my body, but is genuinely nourishing. So I guess I'm saying that I'm, I'm learning to be less restrictive and rigid and act based on beliefs and conditioning of my past and dogma. That's taken me away from trusting and sensing what is really true for my body. And no one can really tell me what those things are except me. And I love that I've had guides along the way that haven't told me what to do. None of my practitioners told me any of this. They just stated the facts as they saw them objectively. Your hip is decompressed. Your abdomen doesn't feel right. <laughs> Your SI joint is compressed. Your spine is flexed to the right. These objective pieces of data were what I needed. And then it was up to me to interpret that and reflect on how I got there. And if anyone had tried to tell me what to do or interpret it for me, it would have interfered with my innate ability to sense what my body was saying and to trust that and experiment with that. That's what this is, it's just one big experiment. 
So I'm seeing so much beauty in this process. And I'm so weirdly happy that despite the fact that it sucks not to be able to enjoy being active, that I'm getting clarity. And I'm getting to deal with this now when I'm only in my 30s, as opposed to this manifesting later as potentially some kind of actual disease state internally or become a bigger biomechanical issue. So for anyone who is in the midst of a mysterious, complex pain in the body situation, I think maybe we don't want to rush out of it so quickly. Because what if the pain is the gift? And I mean, as much as when I'm working with people, I want them to get better. And I'd love to be able to help them with their suffering. I think maybe, maybe one of the most useful things for them is just to be able to understand how we got here and not be so set on rushing out of it before then. And to remember that, I mean, yeah, it's a foot problem, but this is my whole life. And this is truly, I think, when, when Gary Ward and Chris Ritherin of Anatomy and Motion say that this is putting the bio back in biomechanics. This is the real juicy part of it. And I love it. Yeah. Or whatever that was worth for you. <laughs>